I want to start on this Tiger Global news because you have pointed out that Tiger Global has been writing massive checks for companies with very little revenue. How big a problem has this been in Silicon Valley? I think it has been a problem. It's come with a lot of uh, weak governance, right? Because the Tiger Global model included uh, writing a huge check to somebody who was already running a unicorn. Uh, that person, of course, because they've created a unicorn is a bit imperious. And then on top of that, you say, we don't want to go on your board. We're not going to exercise governance. And we defer to you because you are the founder and you're so great. I don't think that's a good way of overseeing companies basically decide I'm not going to oversee them. And that's why you had this governance vacuum for unicorns. That's why you see companies like WeWork or Uber, which actually started out pretty well in their early phases, go off the moral and commercial rails because nobody was manning the store on the board. So what's your read on this massive market correction and how it will impact venture capital and private companies? Well, clearly, it's bound to affect these late stage growth investors like Tiger Global. First, because they were investing late, so the exit that was anticipated was only a year away. That's in the public markets, so or the public markets correct by 25%, like the NASDAQ has done this year. Um, of course, your late stage privates are going to go down with it. Second thing is that the cost of capital matters when you're writing a check for 100 million bucks, right? If you're doing early stage VC, you're writing a $10 million check. Uh, it doesn't matter so much what the interest rate is, but it, it is material when it gets to these very big checks that Tiger Global is writing. So they've faced the brunt of the correction. They've announced that they're going to move into doing earlier stage investing, do more seed and so forth. Uh, that's obviously a smart pivot if they know how to do seed, because it is a different discipline. And then the question for the broader venture capital business is, how does this ripple down the stack? You know, does it mean that Series C valuations go down a lot because Tiger Global is no willing to, not willing to pay quite so much in Series E? If Series C goes down, does that mean Series A goes down? And there's a certain point, Emily, where there's a problem because the cost of hiring engineers is ultimately set by Google. If Google is going to continue paying a lot, then these startups have to pay a lot to get good engineers. And if that price is not reset, the price of talent, then you know, a smaller venture capital check in a Series A is going to make it difficult for the company to work. Now, your book tells a riveting story of the history of venture capital, which you'll have to read if you want to learn more. You argue that Silicon Valley and venture capital is the main reason that Silicon Valley is Silicon Valley. How confident are you that other Silicon Valleys can emerge or are emerging elsewhere, whether it is Boston or Austin or New York or London or China? So I think the story up to around 2005 is basically that Silicon Valley venture capitalists had a special source that other people didn't understand. They had this power law approach where they were quite happy to write eight checks out of 10 that would end up losing money. And then a couple would have these extreme right tail power law returns that would make up for all the losers. And although that sounds a bit obvious now, before around 2005, VCs in Boston didn't really get it. VCs in New York, mostly probably didn't get it either. And certainly nowhere else in the world, maybe with the exception of Israel, uh, did anybody get it. And then in 2005, American VCs from Silicon Valley went to China, then they moved into India. Uh, the whole Israel ecosystem took off, Southeast Asia began. And during COVID, we've seen it spread to you know, Austin, Miami, and so forth. My belief is that the fundamental mindset of Silicon Valley venture capital is now spreading pretty much everywhere. And that as it arrives in different geographies, it transforms the attitude to entrepreneurship. People take more risk. And these startup cultures, which hitherto had been kind of concentrated in Silicon Valley, is going to be everywhere. Now, we've been covering the big story of Sheryl Sandberg leaving Meta. And I've heard so many VCs over the years say, we're just trying to find the next Facebook. Facebook's story, of course, has gotten a lot more complicated. But what is going to drive the next cycle of venture capital and the quest to find the next Facebook, or maybe it's a next something else? Well, you know, Facebook was amazing because it was this software company that scaled unbelievably fast. And the characteristic of both SaaS and consumer software is that you don't need very much capital to have an enormous value creation effect, right? And if you're looking at something that can do 
an equivalent miracle. Um, the most likely, frankly, is crypto, right? I know we've had this big correction recently, but if you think of the story of Uniswap, okay, a guy called Hayden is in his apartment in New York City, and he gets laid off from a engineering job at Siemens. And then he starts to write code because his flatmate, his housemate is, is somebody who works for Ethereum. And he creates this automatic market maker, which goes on the Ethereum blockchain. And this individual, pretty much as an individual, creates a unicorn by himself. I mean, that's even more amazing than Instagram, which was 13 people creating a unicorn. So I think if you're asking specifically, what can do a Facebook style value creation with enormous leverage on a small number of talented people, I think it's crypto.